All right, so, so this talk will basically be a, a, a very high level overview of how uh, network modeling or the modeling of transmission networks appears in the context of mathematical models for the spread of infectious disease. And I've entitled it Wizards and Curtains because so much of this stuff tends to happen behind a curtain. Uh, and even if you are very well versed in one particular form of mathematical modeling for epidemics, um, there are multiple forms and the way in which the modeling gets done can be opaque. So I'm gonna start by pointing out that I, at my experience in this field uh, or the intersection of these fields is that the word model uh, is a central uh, term, uh, academic term that's used in each of these fields, but it often means something different in the different fields. So people often talk at cross purposes uh, when they talk about modeling. Here, I am going to use the word model to mean a formal representation of the dynamic transmission system that we can use for projecting the spread of infection at a population level. So clearly people are becoming very interested in the concept of modeling these days, uh, in part because of the COVID pandemic. And so I pulled the most recent projections from the uh, in Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, the IHME, which is located here in Seattle, Washington. Uh, so this is today's projection. We are comparing the US to Canada. The US is obviously the, the higher line there. Um, these are not counts, they are rates. So they are rates per 100,000 population, which means that Canada's rate of infection is dramatically less than uh, the US, which I guess is no surprise to anyone. And you can see that there is a great deal of uh, uncertainty in the projections as we go out uh, into uh, the coming winter. So I guess everybody is very interested to see what's going to happen here. So you might be asking yourself the question, you know, how do you, this, how do you project from today on beyond? What does that involve? Um, COVID modeling has had a large impact uh, on the response, the policy response to COVID uh, globally, actually, from the beginning. I would say the most robust response was probably in Britain, uh, right at the very beginning of the epidemic. Uh, there was a um, robust debate about uh, the two possible approaches you could take to dealing with COVID, one focusing on the concept of herd immunity, where you let people become ill and recover with immunity and thereby sort of vaccinate the herd once you get up uh, to a high enough level of uh, immunity. The alternative is lockdown. Uh, and uh, as you know, and I'm, you're probably also experiencing this in Canada, this debate is not yet over. In Britain, they have a very strong tradition, both of epidemic modeling in the university setting um, and also connecting epidemic modeling to policy. Um, some of the most important uh, examples of that from the recent past were the outbreak of foot and mouth disease uh, in Great Britain. Some of you may remember that, um, but they've done a lot of measles modeling as well. Uh, for this, for understanding uh, declines in vaccination coverage. Um, they do a lot of modeling around the world, actually. They export a lot of modelers uh, to, uh, to um, global modeling efforts. And as a result of that, they actually have a whole modeling body, uh, an advisory group for the government. It's a standing body. Uh, it got set up uh, after the SARS epidemic, um, the first one. Um, which was what almost 10 years ago now. Uh, it's called SPY M, which is, I can't remember what this stands for, but the M is obviously for modeling and the S is for science, the P is for policy, and 
I'm not sure what the I is. It might be intervention. In any case, this modeling body uh, exists and advises the government on a regular basis. So that is one sort of uh, representation or one approach to understanding how to integrate modeling into policy. I think the US, you could argue, is almost on the other end of the continuum these days. Um, but that said, we, we do have uh, a, quite a few universities that engage and, and private uh, concerns that engage in modeling these days. And for COVID at least, the, the IHME model, which I showed you on the previous slide, really has kind of dominated the, the discussion and the planning. Um, our approach here is more like a 50 state policy approach. We'll see you know, who comes out on top. Um, a number of states actually have modeling teams advising them as well, but there's no real central coordinated policy at this point. So in this talk, I'm going to talk first about uh, infectious diseases and contact networks, um, and then how are contact networks represented in the big models uh, that are informing policy these days. Okay. So thinking about uh, epidemics on networks, there are really two key drivers. One is the pathogens and the properties of the pathogens uh, that are spreading. And the second is what they're spreading on that foundation, which is uh, the contact network. So these traditionally belong to different academic fields. Pathogens are the domain of ecology and evolutionary biology, medicine, biostatistics. Um, Contact networks are more often found in the fields of social network analysis, to some extent in some parts of graph theory uh, and in a small subset of uh, physics. But these fields basically, between the pathogens and the contacts, display what we would call in social network terms, clique-like structure. That is, there's not much cross-field connectivity between the two. So in terms of pathogens, there are properties that pathogens have that determine um, the structure of a model to a large extent. There are the disease compartments. So those of you who are familiar with epidemic modeling are familiar with kind of the SIR modeling framework. Uh, that refers to the compartments that are defined by your status in terms of the disease, susceptible, infected, recovered with immunity, et cetera. Then there are transitions across these compartments uh, due to interaction that can be influenced by interactions between the pathogen and the host that determine infectivity and susceptibility uh, and the duration that you spend in each one of these stages of infection, uh, potentially an asymptomatic period before uh, infectivity starts, et cetera. There are potentially vectors involved in the spread of infection. Malaria is a good example of that, uh, with mosquitoes being one host that has to then bite a human, which becomes another host. Uh, and finally, there are uh, strain diversity and evolution dynamics uh, that are determined to a large extent also by the pathogens. So there are lots of elements of an epidemic model that have uh, nothing to do with a contact network at all and have a lot to do with the structure of the model itself and the kinds of dynamics that are produced by it. All of this is the traditional domain of epidemic modelers and is a very well built out suite of methods at this point. Contact networks though, of course, also have structure. Um, contact networks have these different levels of components. There are nodes. The nodes are defined by the infection reservoirs in the case of epidemic models, so they can be persons uh, or and or vectors. There are links which are defined by the transmission mechanism, so HIV spreads through sex or sharing needles. Um, other kinds of pathogens spread through the sharing of items in the home, for example. Uh, and COVID is spread through simple physical proximity. When you think about this, what that means is that the link that is relevant for any particular uh, pathogen is uh, going to potentially be quite different in terms of the density and the structure. 
And then there are layers in contact networks as well, which are settings that aggregate these nodes and links. Uh, communities are sort of a broad layer uh, that structure the likelihood of interaction. Uh, there's workplace, schools, households, etc. So this kind of modeling is mostly the domain of social network analysts. And where the pathogen meets the network is in the infection rate term. Uh, and that's traditionally represented, the notation can be different in different uh, fields, but it's represented by uh, something like beta SI, where S is uh, the number of susceptible nodes, I is the number of infected nodes, and beta is what's called the force of infection. Uh, so that's the likelihood that when a susceptible node meets an infected node, uh, there is a transmission uh, multiplied by the number of contacts and the probability of actually uh, reaching an infected node by a susceptible node. So typically that shows up looking something like the contact rate times the probability of transmission given contact. It's scaled by the number of uh, nodes in the population so that uh, this turns S into a susceptible times the probability that they meet an infected. You can add heterogeneity to a model like this. Um, obviously, the force of infection can be heterogeneous uh, for different classes of susceptibles, say by age, different classes of infecteds, also say by age. So J and K can be groups in the population, so demographic groups or other kinds of groups. And uh, the heterogeneity can also refer to the likelihood of susceptibility and infectivity uh, varying by group, uh, as well as the contact rates varying by group. And of course, the contact rates varying by group and the mixing between groups is the network. So you have to drill way down into an epidemic model to see where the network actually meets the pathogen. Uh, and this is where the work gets done. So how are networks represented in the big models? There are three basic frameworks that uh, dominate in the field of epidemic modeling. Uh, there are deterministic compartmental models, which we call DCMs. There are agent-based or individual-based models, BBMs and IBMs, and then network models. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these frameworks and how the network is represented in that framework. Deterministic compartmental models are really the workhorse of epidemic modeling, and to a large extent, they continue even in the era of COVID uh, to dominate uh, the kinds of modeling that is done. So in Britain, for example, most of the models that are informing the SPI-M group are still deterministic compartmental models. So uh, they traditionally divide the population up into compartments. The compartments are defined by the uh, disease state. So in this case, this is where SIR comes from, susceptibles, infecteds, and recovered with immunity. There are transitions between the compartments. So you can see the beta I here uh, is what leads the susceptibles to become infected. Gamma is a rate of recovery from infected into the recovered category. Um, it's possible once you've recovered to become in this model susceptible again, uh, there's the rate alpha at which that occurs, as well as there's uh, demographic inflow and outflow. So that's a classic kind of compartmental representation. Of course, these models are traditionally not this simple, certainly not at the research level. You add many more compartments to reflect population level heterogeneity. So just as an example, this is a DCM for HIV, which divides the population up uh, into, there are the susceptibles, there are infecteds, uh, but there are infecteds who are unaware of their status, they're unaware but on PrEP, which means that they're taking a pre, uh, prophylaxis, but they're unaware that they are currently infected. There are those that are diagnosed, that are those that are engaged in care, those who are treated, and those who are virally suppressed. So you can get uh, a very complex model here. This is then broken down additionally by the stage of infection, acute infection, and then uh, levels of infection over time that are a function of your CD4 count. 
So a traditional research uh, DCM often has hundreds and hundreds of compartments like this. Once you have hundreds of compartments, this original transition from susceptible to infected now has to represent how the susceptible individuals in all of these different categories interact with all of these different infected groups. So that's your, your contact rate subdivided or uh, indexed by uh, the group of the susceptible and the group of the infected. There can be level variation by group, so some groups can be more active than others, and traditionally in the field of uh, sexually transmitted infections, but now also for COVID, you've probably all heard the term of super spreaders or core groups. Core groups is more like uh, the HIV STI literature. That means that some groups are more active than others, so they play a larger role in the dynamics of transmission. Um, increasingly in the COVID modeling for for the DCM field, uh, there are distinctions made by age as well. So we're introducing heterogeneity by age, uh, and that reflects both differences in the levels of activity, but also differences in mixing between the different age groups. So I'm going to give you an example of a research level model on age mixing. Um, it, the research question here was uh, whether variations in age mixing that you see across different countries influence the potential impact of two different policy interventions, work or school closures, uh, on the spread of uh, pathogen like influenza. So not really all that different than the COVID modeling that uh, we would be interested in. The data here come from a survey called the Polymod survey that was uh, conducted in Europe in a number of countries. And uh, it's combined with data from the demographic and health surveys, uh, which was, the DHS actually happens in 152 countries. There's slight differences in the, in the type of data that were collected. Uh, so they did some harmonization beforehand. And what I'm going to show you is the multi-level age mixing matrices that uh, they use in this project for understanding mixing by age within households, within workplaces, within schools, and then in other social settings. The Polymod survey is a very interesting survey. It's what we would call an egocentric, uh, egocentric contact network survey. It's a sample survey of respondents with a 24-hour contact diary. Um, and because they're comparing these surveys to DHS, there's lots of intermediate modeling that is done here, so I won't get into all of that. But what I want to show you is, is how the heterogeneity and age mixing, this is actually the contact network that sits underneath this whole model. The heterogeneity and age mixing is represented. So what you can see here is these different layers of social activities uh, that they take from the Polymod survey data. So contacts that are made within the households, within work, in schools, in other social settings, and then when you add these all together. And what each of these uh, squares represents is the age of the respondent uh, in the survey and the age of the contact that they're reporting here. So this is showing that in households, you see a lot of mixing on the diagonal. Um, that is probably uh, partnered adults, uh, spouses, or pairs. Uh, but then you can also see there are older adults here that interact with the young kids. Um, those could be grandparents. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, this is 40-year-olds interacting with young kids as well. So this is a very different pattern in households, the age mixing that you see there from the age mixing you see at work, which is heavily concentrated among adults. You can still see that at least in Germany, there appears to be some uh, density on the diagonal. So a higher likelihood that you interact with people at work who are close to you in age. But now we can see now in comparison to Bolivia, once you get into the workplace setting, there's almost what we would call random mixing. You, regardless of your age, you still have to be in the working age group. But once you get into the workplace, you're as likely to interact with members of other ages as you are your own age. 
and somewhere in between here for South Africa. You can see the pattern in schools. This is largely driven by teachers and students and students being clustered in grades. In other social settings, there's a fair amount of uh, on diagonal mixing, which suggests again, people mix with others that are close to them in age. And you put the whole thing together and you end up with an age mixing matrix that looks like the bottom row here. There's clearly a great deal of better, uh, variation between the countries, the three that they were examining here. They, they looked at many more countries, but the three that they sort of picked out for special uh, comparison were Germany, Bolivia, and South Africa. And what these differences in age mixing do is they have, they change the effect of interventions when those interventions are school closures, for example, or work closures or social distancing. So those were the three different types of interventions that they then examined on the basis of these age mixing networks in these different countries. And what you can see is that, and from these graphs, that they're fairly complicated graphs, the gray bars here are the population distribution by age. So that's the population profile. And you can see the population profiles are very different in the different countries. Um, the rows here are different interventions with different levels of potential infectivity, so the reproductive rate of infection. So in the top two rows here, what we're looking at is a reproductive rate of 1.2, which means that the typical person at the beginning of the epidemic uh, who becomes infected infects 1.2 other people. And you can see the effect of school closure plus distancing here, and comparing that to a 50% uh, workforce reduction. And the impact of the intervention is shown basically by uh, the school closure effect is shown in blue. No intervention is shown in orange. So what you can see is if you have no intervention, the orange is going to be the same here uh, in the first two rows within each column. So you can see the population and you can see the number of infections you'd get with no intervention. If you were to implement the school closure plus social distancing, you can reduce the rate of infection in Germany down to just this, the blue infection here. If instead you aim for a workforce reduction, you basically eliminate the epidemic. You can see there, there are no cases here at all. The workplace contacts uh, uh, go down to zero. In Bolivia, school closure actually eliminates infection as it does in South Africa. Workplace reductions actually don't have as large an effect. Once you increase, and this is the pathogen part, you increase the rate, the reproduction rate, so it's gone from 1.2 to 1.5. Now you can see that uh, school closures really don't have much of an effect anymore in Germany. They did before, but they don't now. Uh, workplace reductions still are fairly effective, not as effective as they were before, but still effective. Um, the school closure reductions still are close to 100% for Bolivia. The workplace reductions get you almost nothing. And in South Africa, you get some, you get a pretty good bang for the buck for the school closures, though you still get some infections once the infectivity rate is high and the workplace reductions really don't help you much at all. So this is an example of how a deterministic compartmental model would use um, a contact matrix, an age-based mixing contact matrix in order to understand uh, the potential policy impact of different interventions. So if we go behind the curtain here, it's worth understanding uh, how this modeling, you know, some, some of the bigger picture aspects of this modeling. The first is that the network in this epidemic model is fixed. It's not, the CKJ here is driven by the total age mixing matrix. It's not a model of the matrix, it's the matrix itself both with and without the specific layers. And it doesn't change except with respect to the intervention. The intervention then changes the, the overall rates of mixing in those matrices. Second, in this particular model, there are no demographic dynamics, which makes some sense because they're really only looking at 
um, sort of one season's worth of infection. So there are no entries and exits here. Uh, if there were entries and exits, these could change the mixing matrix margins and the cells. And at that point, you would need to have some kind of a model for this matrix as opposed to the matrix itself. But the key limitations of these deterministic compartmental models is that the contacts here are individual acts in these models. There's really no easy way to represent persistent partnerships. So what that does is when you use a DCM in some cases like sexually transmitted infections, that leads to some very strange behavioral assumptions that are resting behind the curtain. So what this means, for example, is every time somebody wants to have a contact, they close their eyes and they pick from the population. Uh, and it might be a biased pick. There might be some heterogeneity with respect to their preference for an age. But the individual that they pick uh, really is randomly chosen otherwise. And that happens for each subsequent act. So there's no way to really represent a partnership where you have the same, uh, the same person that you have repeated acts with. Uh, and that, that turns out to be quite problematic, actually. Uh, in addition, these models are deterministic. That's what the B stands for. And as a result, uh, you miss a lot of the stochastic variation that can occur in epidemics. So it was those limitations that led uh, the modeling field to really invest pretty heavily over the last, uh, I would say, 20 years in agent-based models. They're sometimes called individual-based models. Um, these models are stochastic, almost always, um, and the individual agents are sort of endowed with certain rules that determine their behavior. This allows you to represent persistent partnerships, and the key thing that allows you to do that is now that you have access to these individuals, which you don't have in the compartment modeling. In the compartment models, you just, it's like a bowl of jello, basically. You can take out a spoonful uh, at a rate, a certain rate, but you can't identify individuals in that. So that's why you can't represent the partnerships. Um, the individual based models allow you to represent partnerships. Uh, but in an agent based modeling framework, the rules for partnership formation turn out to be fairly complicated. So how are partnerships actually formed? This is where the heterogeneity is going to happen. This is where the contact network is formed. So this is where the network meets the model uh, in agent based models. The most common approach to this is a queuing algorithm. So for example, uh, this comes from an HIV model for heterosexual partnerships. There's a male queue and a female queue, and a male is chosen from the male queue with respect to having, with a certain probability that's determined by a number of different things. So in general, you get the highest probability male or some version of the highest probability male being chosen at each time point. They then choose a female. There's a highest probability match there, but there are other sorts of matches that can be made. Uh, and once that match happens, then you evaluate whether or not a uh, disease is going to be transmitted. The key limitation here from, from a network modeling perspective is that there's really no control of the population level dyadic outcomes. This is individual based. So there's certain probability a man's chosen, certain probability a woman is chosen, and hopefully that will reproduce what you see in uh, the data, but there's no guarantee that it will. There's no model basically for the joint effects of multiple attributes as well on the probability of a tie. So it becomes very difficult to juggle the many different things that might determine who would show up in the queue and who would be their most likely partner. There's no principled way in these models to reproduce the joint distribution of partnerships that you can observe in data. So the models tend to be quite simple and they have some odd assumptions typically about whose individual preferences dominate. So in the queuing model here, for example, it's the male's preference that dominates. So I'm gonna move on to uh, network models. Uh, just uh, in order to give us some time to discuss. And here, what I would say is in the field, if you go into the field, you're gonna find a lot of people who talk about using a network model. I would say the terminology here is still not quite uh, 
figured out and somewhat contested because uh, network models, everybody thinks they're the cool new kid on the block, so everybody wants to be doing network models. And in a sense, all agent-based models and all individual-based models do produce a network, there's no question. But they don't necessarily directly control a network. So I'd like to say, I'd like to introduce here the concept that uh, a network model actually is different than an agent-based model in the sense that it has principled methods for representing the network itself. Uh, and these can be theoretical, so you can define the network in terms of, say, a scale-free uh, model or a small world model. They can be descriptive or empirical, uh, or they can be, and those tend, the descriptive empirical types tend to not have a model that that um, intervenes between the data and uh, your epidemic dynamics. Uh, it's just a, a straight plug-in of the data, and I'll show you an example of that. And the last example is uh, these generative statistical models. And so some of you in this audience are probably familiar. These come from the social network field, uh, temporal exponential random graph models, and um, the stochastic actor-oriented models. These are actual models as opposed to simple descriptive empirical statistics that represent the probability of a tie forming between two nodes. So there are lots of different levels of structure that you can represent in a network model. Uh, there are macro level structures. Um, and uh, if you've seen any of Alessandro Vespignani's work, um, uh, he often, especially his COVID work, uh, his recent COVID work has been looking at uh, sort of macro level models of uh, cross country travel patterns. Uh, there are meso-level models that look at a community and uh, represent the interaction patterns within communities, within households, hospitals, for example, nursing homes, workplaces, schools. I would say these meso-level models, these are what we would call bipartite models in uh, network analysis. I would say this is kind of an unmet need. There's, there's, there's a lot of for those of you looking for something to do, there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in this area. And then there are these micro level models, and I'll give a couple of examples here where we're actually representing the individual nodes and links with a lot of heterogeneity, but not necessarily this kind of bipartite structure. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a micro level model research model uh, that is comes from the descriptive empirical uh, sort of tradition. The research question was uh, whether it's possible to use rescheduling rather than case isolation, rescheduling of the staff uh, rather than case isolation to reduce hospital acquired infections. And the basic idea is you try to kind of create, you're familiar I'm sure with since COVID with the term of bubbles, you're trying to create sort of bubbles uh, of groups that don't interact in order to reduce the spread. And you can do that through uh, rescheduling. And so what they were looking at were levels of heterogeneity that operated at the node level. Uh, so the role of a particular node, the patient, nurse, doctor, or administrator. There was tie heterogeneity in terms of uh, the duration of the encounter and the frequency of encounters per week. And there's what we would call dyad dependence in the temporal sequencing and the scheduling constraints. So this is a fairly complex model. Although what they are going to do is represent this purely as a, an empirically observed network. And they did that, the empirical study was drawn from a facility study with one week of wearable proximity sensors. So every time uh, one of the patients, nurses, doctors, or staff came within a certain distance of uh, someone else with a wearable sensor, that set off a little ping. So they had the entire contact network over time uh, over the course of the week. So you can see that uh, the, this is sort of the distribution of the number of individuals in the study. So 75 people, about a, quarter, or about a third of these were nurses, a third of them were patients, and the rest were divided between uh, the, the 
doctors, the clinical staff, and uh, the administrators. Um, by far, the largest fraction of uh, contacts per individual occurred for the nurses. That should be uh, not too surprising. The medical staff had a large number of contacts per person uh, as well, actually. And so the average duration uh, uh, in seconds of contacts per individual was about the same for the nurses and for the medical staff. But of course, the nurses are a much larger group than the medical staff, so that they're gonna create a larger share of the overall density of the network. You can then look at uh, the mixing matrix. So this is like our age mixing matrix, but now represented in tabular format. So we're looking at nurse-nurse interactions, nurse-patient, doctor-doctor, uh, nurse-administrator, et cetera. Um, the largest single block of infections are coming from the, these nurse-nurse interactions. That's almost 40% of the infections uh, and about 40% of the overall duration of contact. Uh, nurse patient obviously is going to be uh, also very high. That's about 21% of the infections in time. Uh, doctors spend a fair amount of time together as well, uh, substantially more time talking to each other than they do to the patients. Um, so some of you might recognize that in your real life as well. So this nurse-nurse interaction was what they wanted to cut down on rather than cutting down on the nurse-patient interaction. That would be a form of isolation, um, trying to reduce the contacts between nurses and patients. So they were trying instead to use scheduling to reduce the nurse-nurse interactions. And what they did was they took this observed empirical dynamic network that they had from the wearable sensors and then rewired it to represent um, intervention scenarios. And the first was a 30% direct reduction of interactions between nurses and patients. Of course, that's going to impact care. And the second was rescheduling of nurses, which does not impact care. And they tried two different forms of this one, which preserved uh, or did not preserve regular schedules, uh, and the other uh, satisfied constraints on total shift hours and weekly total hours. And basically what they found was uh, the, the reductions that they found, so this is basically what you observe in terms of uh, the risk reduction with no change. Um, the risk reduction with contact isolation, the 30% reduction in contacts, uh, got you about a 30% reduction in risk as well. And one of the versions of the network uh, uh, changes, the rescheduling, also uh, had the same effect as that level of social contact reduction. So the, it turns out it works best with regular scheduling that does not satisfy weekly hour constraints, but you can get the same bang for the buck, the same reduction in hospital acquired infections through rescheduling as you can through patient isolation. All right, so looking behind the curtain here, the network in this case is also fixed. It's longitudinal over time, but it's fixed. So this was one facility over one week, 75 people, and that has real limitations then on generalizability. And if you had a model of this network, you might be able to play with the model to think about generalizability, but they don't have a model. It's just, it's literally the empirical network that they send the transmission through. And the rewiring that they did, it was very complicated how they had to do that, and, and precisely because they didn't have a model. Uh, it was a very bespoke algorithm um, that was used to, to do that. Um, and what's interesting here, you might not realize it reading the paper, but there's actually no transmission process. It's really just the number and duration of contacts, and that is used as a proxy for the reachable path of hospital-acquired infection. Um, that's a, that's a pretty common thing to do. I think it's very useful what it defines, this reachable path, what it defines is sort of the maximal possible reach of uh, the, the infection. So another example uh, uh, that we have, I'm not gonna go through it because I wanna leave some time for uh, uh, discussion. I can come back to that if people are interested. In COVID, uh, there's 
you know, a lot of interest in the role of super spreaders or super spreading events. Really from day one, they've kind of pushed this narrative, but it's often misguided. This notion that super spreaders are what are spreading the infection, I think, they tried to make the same arguments in HIV and sexually transmitted infections. For you to get a persistent epidemic, you need to have sustained transmission in the general population. And uh, we developed a little uh, uh, um, example here uh, at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, which was called, you know, can I please just visit one friend? And it showed how quickly households get connected if someone from the household or two people from the household visit just one friend. It's extremely quickly. You don't need super spreaders in order to create connectivity. So behind the curtain, the networks in that case were also fixed and not dynamic, but at least there was a model for the networks. Uh, it was an exponential family random graph model with degree target statistics. There was still no transmission process as before. We had just the ties as a proxy for the reachable path. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what a full network epidemic model looks like. Um, this has a dynamic model, an actual statistical model for the network uh, for partnership formation and dissolution. That model governs the full joint distribution of network statistics, and it can be a fairly complicated model. I can show you an example of that. And it, in, because it's a statistical model and it's a principled statistical model, we can actually guarantee that it reproduces the observed statistics in data uh, in your simulation on average, right? Which is a nice thing to be able to do. And you're doing that for the joint distribution of all of the statistics in your model. It's estimated from empirical data, ideally uh, a network sample. You don't have to have the entire network observed. We have models uh, and methods for dealing with egocentric network data. And these kinds of models can adjust to changes in population composition and size. So you can have an open cohort model. Then you overlay all of this with a dynamic epidemic transmission process. And what it ends up looking like is something like this. So this is one of the first models that we did back in 2010. It was a model for HIV spread in uh, the young adult population, 18 to 25 year olds. Uh, it was a simulation based on a study called the Ad Health Study, uh, in which we saw that people had on average about uh, three partners over a 10 year period, um, and we, uh, represented here uh, the spread, the, the reachable path, the growth of the reachable path basically from 10 infected seeds uh, through all of the partnerships that are formed. And what you can see is that there are some red partnerships, some blue partnerships, and some gray partnerships. The red are uh, partnerships that are formed when the person has another partner at that time. So they're concurrent with another partnership. The blue are serially monogamous, and the gray were partnerships that haven't yet formed uh, or joined the reachable path. So there are 600 nodes, roughly 600 nodes that you're seeing here. They were originally arrayed as the network in terms of their contacts, and now here what you're seeing is the 10 originally infected seeds in the network, and then each generation of infection. So the people that those seeds infected, and then the next generation that was infected by the first, the third generation, et cetera. And the purpose of this particular simulation was to look at the question of uh, how uh, concurrency, the, the overlapping of partnerships in terms of their duration influences the spread of infection in this network. So the original network had 10,000 nodes. What we focused on in the simulation here was the 600 that end up in the forward reachable set from the 10 seeds. Uh, the blue ties represented here means that the person who joined in the generation below joined when the dyad was mutually monogamous. The red was when at least one of the nodes, possibly both of the nodes had another partner on the side. The black ties, which have now all disappeared, were active at that moment in time, but if they don't get joined to the reachable set while they're still active, then they disappear. What we find is while concur the concurrent ties were 
only 5% of all ties in the entire network over the 10 year simulation, but they accounted for 50% of the forward reachable set. So this overlapping in time of partnerships was critical for creating the network connectivity that allowed for spread. And you can see from the 10 infected seeds that the, the, where you have these red ties dominating, you have both more people infected at each generation. This is due to something we call the backwards path of transmission because sequence is no longer protective. But you also see uh, more generations of infection within the 10 year period and that is uh, a more rapid transmission process, so a, a shorter serial interval. So concurrency had a very large impact on the spread of infection here. This kind of framework that we used for that simulation uh, is uh, a principal statistical framework for network epidemiology. Uh, the tools have all been based in this kind of open science development. We have open source code, open development on GitHub, uh, all of the packages that we uh, support there, which we've been supporting for about, well, last 15 years, are modular, easily extendable. We have workshops and online training materials, so we're very much uh, committed to the kind of open science framework. The models can be estimated from what we call egocentrically sampled network data that makes it feasible for using them for public health work because those are just standard sample surveys, and they're scalable. Our current uh, research models have 800,000 nodes in them. I can give you an example from our workflow if it turns out we have time. Uh, I'm gonna leave that uh, for the Q&A period. I would say so when you're looking at evaluating models, um, the things I would think about are what kind of data do you need? Um, for the Vespignani type network models, you generally need big data. You don't have a model for the network, and if you don't have a model for the network, you end up basically needing pretty much the whole network in order to see what's going on. Uh, for the temporal exponential random graph models that I showed you an example of here with the network movie, I would say that's tiny data. Um, that was based on a, a sample of in this particular case, it was 15,000 individuals uh, from the entire US population. Uh, but we routinely estimate these, yeah, I would say 15,000 is not a bad number, but that's tiny relative to what we'd see for Vespignani's work. Um, also, we're thinking about generalizability. If you're working with a descriptive or an empirical based model, like the example of the hospital acquired infection, that's very much tied to that one source of data. It's very difficult to generalize from that. Although I think the insights there were very useful. Um, a generative model can be data driven, but because uh, you can estimate the parameters uh, from a particular setting with uh, standard collected data, you can also compare then across settings and that's what gives you the ability to assess generalizability. Model assessment is also really important. Uh, I won't get into this again, unless people are interested during the Q&A period. There is a distinction between what we would call calibration, uh, in which is the stage of modeling where you modify your parameters so that you can fit some observed empirical targets. Ideally, you are modifying parameters uh, in the model that for which there is significant uncertainty. So you have some justification for varying those parameters in order to hit the targets. Model validation is different. That's when, because under calibration, the whole point is to hit the targets. So that doesn't validate your model. Validation is prediction out of sample, basically. Uh, and there's not a lot of validation that goes on in epidemic modeling in general. It's a problem. And then finally, uh, it's important to evaluate for models whether you can compare these models with other models. Um, that's relatively easy within frameworks, so DCMs can be compared, um, but it's difficult to compare across frameworks often. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of an open area, I would say, for research.
And in terms of network modeling, I think what we really need that we don't have in the toolkit right now are these generative dynamic models for bipartite networks. So if there's anybody out there in the audience who's uh, interested in working on these, I'd, uh, I'd love to hear from you. All right, I'm gonna stop there uh, and take questions. Uh, and hopefully we have time for a few questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martina. And I guess uh, you left us with quite a few questions. Uh, so, uh, est-ce que quelqu'un a une question à poser? Uh, vous pouvez utiliser le micro ou utiliser la conversation dans Zoom à votre guise. Et comme je le disais plus tôt, s'il y a des personnes qui préfèrent poser la question en français, il n'y a pas de souci, on va essayer de traduire. Alors? <laughs> Everybody's muted. Yeah. So? Hi, uh, I have a question. Sorry. Please. So, uh, first of all, nice talk. It was very well explained. Thanks a lot for... Uh, like distilling all the information that is out there in modeling. Uh, so my question relates to um, uh, generalization of ABMs. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the scenarios where uh, you would think that the ABMs cannot generalize well? As in well, ABMs are stochastic and if they are well calibrated and if they I mean, can we still, uh, what do you call it? Uh, can we still believe in them? So it's a great question. Um, my concern with the ABMs is that, you know, there's an algorithm that creates the contacts, but there's no real, there's no model in the same way there is a statistical model in the context of the network models that I was describing, right? So for a statistical model, I can take that model to the data, I can estimate the parameters, I can tell you the variability in my estimate. I, if it's an MLE, which it is in our case, a maximum likelihood estimate, I can also talk about the bias in the estimates. Um, and I can compare parameters in the model, say from United States data to models from, with the same type of data from some other country, right? So there's a whole principled framework for model comparison and generalization, right? Where generalization has a lot to do with it, you're, you're making a generalization from your sample to the population, which is what, you know, so can I do that, right? So we have a framework for that with a statistical model that doesn't exist in an agent-based model. You're right, you can calibrate, mm -hmm. but with the thousands of parameters that go into yeah. these models, it's always possible to hit a set of targets. So really, I think what you have to do there is a lot more validation, right? So take your, and I don't even know for, how would you change your algorithm, for example, if you went from, say, Canada to the US to try to explain the difference in the COVID epidemics that we're seeing in these two countries? Um, I see, uh, so I mean, one way is to just to uh, use standardization, like demographic standardization, so that we have um, uh, a country specific uh, contact structure. Um, right, and so you have one observation of that contact structure, right? Yes. Probably, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. And how many, so what kinds of uh, heterogeneity do you represent in that contact structure? Um, age, uh, age breakdown, mainly, specifically age breakdown, um, and then the susceptibility broken down by age. Um, okay, so yeah. let me show you something then. I'm going to share my screen. This is a great okay. question, right? I'm going to okay. share my screen and show you uh, one of the things that um, sort of, I think, distinguishes the network modeling okay. While you do this, Martina, because we're uh, reaching the official end of our meeting, but we keep we can keep talking with the people interested here. There's no mm -hmm. problem with that. 
Uh, so I'm sorry, I somehow thought it was a longer, uh, I thought it was a longer period. I'm very sorry. Well, that's all right. We've organized this conference very last minute, so uh, we may have uh, overviewed some uh, elements. But, so people who, who can stay, wanted to stay, you're welcome to. Donc, c'est théoriquement, on avait annoncé 13h30, mais uh, si vous souhaitez rester et poser d'autres questions, il n'y a vraiment aucun problème. Il y a une question que j'ai vue dans le chat que uh, je n'oublierai pas de poser uh, aussitôt qu'on aura terminé avec la réponse de celle-ci. So, please go ahead. Okay. So what I'm showing you is just some output from one of our research models now for HIV here in Washington state. And the heterogeneity that we add to the contact patterns are uh, level heterogeneity and numbers of contacts by race, by region, by age group. And then we have mixing by race, by region, by age group. We control the degree distribution, so the proportion of uh, nodes that have concurrent ties here, whether they have ties in another network, so this is an overlaid three network model, and then we prohibit certain types of ties, right? So you can see there are a lot of terms here. For all of these terms, we have statistical estimates of their importance and uh, traditional statistical inference for whether or not uh, they appear, whether we can make this inference to the population. Wow. So for it's us, based on me, surveyed data, like pardon? the mixing of race and everything else is based on surveyed data. That's correct. Yes, that's exactly right. Wow. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So it's all all of that is based on, and it's an egocentric sexual sexual network sample. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you more offline about it. Calibration, in a sense, for us for the statistical model is done using MCMC, right? So we're estimating the parameters. We can use MCMC diagnostics to see how well those worked. But what I'm going to skip to here is this model um, has the theoretical, because it's a maximum likelihood estimate for exponential families, we are guaranteed in theory and in practice uh, to hit the target statistics in the population on average. And you can see here exactly how well this model does this dynamically over time with this network that forms and dissolves ties. So you can't see what all the individual terms are here, but they're the same ones that are in the model. The blue dot is what's observed, and uh, the box plot is 100 simulations from the model uh, over time. What does that look like over time? You can see that we hit all these things pretty much exactly with some variation. How are we doing in terms of the duration of ties? Well, it takes a while uh, for these particular ties. The target age is about uh, 250 weeks. So it takes a while uh, for ties to reach that. So the burn-in is about 1,000 uh, time steps. But the hazard of tie dissolution is hit from the beginning, right? So. This is just an example of how we can use a model-based approach. And what I can tell you is that because we have the fits here, I could do a study in another setting and get the same model fit, right? And then compare the coefficients and see whether they're the same, right? So we can see whether there are significant differences. So we have a principal framework for a model comparison and uh, assessment. I see. Thank you. Uh, I have another question uh, in the chat box, so mm -hmm. I will uh, read it. Uh, in the context of COVID, uh, what are the key inputs that we are still missing? That's not a small question. That mm -hmm. we are still missing to be able to better leverage the models that are currently available. Oh my God. <laughs> Can I say everything? <laughs> you know, I mean, I was just reading yesterday in the news that uh, here in the U.S., the CDC has quietly changed its position about the role of uh, aerosols in COVID transmission. Uh, the distance over which they degrade is no longer considered to be six feet. It's substantially more than that. And the amount of time that those aerosols persist uh, is thought to be now much longer than it was. That's, that's the, one of the most basic elements of any transmission model, right? That determines the, what's a link. We still don't know what's a link, right? Second, 
I'm, and I'm, I'm not even gonna focus on the network stuff, I'm just gonna focus on the pathogen stuff. What do we know about recovery? So you go from S, susceptible to infected, there's an asymptomatic phase, we're not quite sure how long that is, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually you do recover if you don't die. Most people are assumed to recover with immunity, but what do we know about that immunity? Is it sterilizing, i.e. 100%, and is it permanent or transient? So this is a coronavirus, like the common cold. The common cold has uh, a transient immunity of people think it's about six months or something like that. We don't know. We don't know what happens once you get into that R box, whether you transit back to susceptible or whether you stay there permanently as you might with measles, for example. Um, so there's, it's profound, the lack of knowledge that we have right now for, uh, for modeling. Anybody who's doing this modeling should be humbled by it. So I'll just say that. Oh, thank you. Well, a uh, big challenge. Maybe I have one question for you, uh, because this is an issue at our institute, uh, a concern, I would say. Uh, inequity uh, differences between people. And I haven't seen yet, and of course will be even harder to model, the, taking into consideration how much it hurts some people uh, to prevent the disease. And, and I don't know if you've heard of anybody trying to model this. I know, it, of course, We've seen in England, for example, they see how much people are much more affected by the disease uh, in certain area of the city where people are poorer, but we still don't know how much people are affected by mm -hmm. the way we deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know yeah. if you've heard about anything being done along that, those lines. Yeah, it's a great question as well. Um, what I will say is that uh, economists are right up there with physicists as, you know, the world's uh, most prolific modelers. So they jumped on this uh, early on. And uh, even in March, I think by March, they had an online publication on COVID and economics that was by the end of March in its 19th issue already, you know, it was just kind of crazy how quickly they they scaled up. So I have I'm not familiar with that literature. But I suspect that's, uh, that's where you might want to look. There are kind of two approaches that you could take there. One is just documenting the the disparate impacts of COVID. And for that, you really need to do empirical surveys, right? And so it's gonna take some time for us to scale up the machinery to do those surveys. Uh, there's somebody here in our group who's doing that, but it's very specific. It's looking at the homeless population. Um, so yeah, it's gonna take a while for, I think the academic community to uh, create the entire tool set that we need. Um, but it's very important, I agree. I mean, there are a lot of, theories out there now about the disparities in prevalence in the US, for example, uh, by race and poverty. Um, most of those theories, I think, have to do with uh, the fact that what we call essential workers are typically the workers that are the most poorly paid and the ones who have the most contact with others, right? And so a lot of those essential workers are people of color. And, uh, and they were not allowed to stay home. They were essential workers during you know, the key peak periods in uh, infection and uh, transmission. So, so there's that plus uh, poverty tends to lead to, or lower income tends to lead to higher numbers of people in the household and denser housing units in general, which again, uh, has an impact on disease transmission. So yeah, it's yeah. a big issue. Thank you. Uh, unless I have other questions, do I? Uh, I, I would have a question. Go on. Um, thank you. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Um, you presented compartmental models and agent based models um, separately, but what do you think about hybrid models trying to uh, leverage 
um, the advantages of both compartmental models and Asian-based models. Um, my main project at the moment is a hybrid model combining both aspects to study the spread of neurodegenerative proteins in the brain. So instead of having individuals uh, as agents, agents represent some abnormal protein, which when it becomes misfolded, it corresponds mm -hmm. to belonging to the infected compartment. And in this model, the network is based on the structural connectome of the brain instead of a social network. Mm -hmm. so I'm interested in your opinion about these hybrid models combining both the, compartment, the compartments and the, the dynamics of the agent. So what's the compartment in your case? A susceptible agent would be the normal protein. Ah, okay. I would just call, call that, that is heterogeneity in an agent-based model. It's just the disease heterogeneity as opposed to, say, demographic for me, or I guess particular type of protein for potentially for you. I don't know what the heterogeneity is in your agents. Mm -hmm. um, but by compartment, I mean something slightly different. Okay. So a compartment, means that what we're talking about is any but any uh any part of any stock in the population that's in a compartment is sort of homogeneously represented as a total number there and you can pull off rates of it doesn't have to be an individual you could pull off two-thirds of an individual to transit from susceptible to infected right there's there's really there is no individual there there's just a there's a mass which can be infinitely divided into as one of my friends called it an atto fox right one to the negative 18th of a fox right which is why compartmental models never get rid of diseases because you can't you it's like zeno's paradox right so that is a compartmental model it is a mathematical representation and you're not doing that you've got an agent based model that has heterogeneity as far so as I can tell, region, it. for every region, I would have a proportion of susceptible agents, infected agents, and removed mm -hmm. agents. Oh yeah. So but you still; those agents are still individually identifiable, right? Yeah. So the rate of of uh, new infections, your incidence, is not a rate. You can turn it into a rate, but there's a numerator. There's literally individuals there that you know made a transition from susceptible to infected. That's not a compartmental model. That's an agent-based model or an individual-based model. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, again, Martina, thank you to answer this invitation and uh, to find room in your uh agenda thank you everybody i know we're losing people but that's quite normal when uh because people have well i guess other things to do yeah. online <laughs> most of them uh but really again thank you i really like this idea of uh well asking questions about models and asking uh what we're not seeing and of course um being a social network analyst myself, I do have a bias on your <laughs> position. Uh, last word, anybody? Otherwise, we will uh, on va compléter cette séance si vous n'avez pas d'autres questions. Uh, ah, euh, Kate nous rappelle qu'il y a un enregistrement de la présentation qui est fait. Il y a certains aspects de la modélisation que vous pourriez vouloir revoir. Uh, Et euh, sinon, euh, je vous remercie d'avoir été là et revenez nous voir pour nos prochaines présentations, notamment notre rencontre inter-institut. Uh, thank you again. And uh, hope to see you sometimes. Yeah. Maybe. In the flesh. <laughs> in the flesh, yes. Who knows? Maybe in Australia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be lovely. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.